This week on Motor Week, Chris Goffey and the latest van to car transformation, the remarkable Citroën Berlingo. We'll tell you how you can fight back against dodgy car dealers and mechanics. Richard Hammond can't quite decide whether he likes the new Sonata or not. And Mercedes massive Maybach, they're actually going to build it. Now, when I was a very young man, I had access to the works minivan after hours. And I very soon discovered that a single mattress fitted snugly in the back. I'm sure I wasn't the first, and I won't be the last, to use a van as a recreational vehicle. Latest recruit to those ranks is Citroen, with this, the Berlingo Multispace. We first saw this device as a concept car at the Motor Show two years ago. It's unashamedly based on Citroen's Berlingo van. It's already on sale in Europe, where it's been a huge hit, with over 50,000 examples sold. Now, Citroen are hedging their bets about the car over here, and they say there's only going to be a thousand available until the end of the year. I hereby make a prediction they are wrong. They're going to sell as many of these as they can make. Why? Well, in the first place, it's a fun vehicle with three bright exterior colours and a colour-coded interior. In the second place, there's just acres of room in this thing. In the first place, it's got a simply enormous sunroof, a massive 20 square feet. Citroën say it turns the car almost into a convertible, and they're right. Talk about let the sunshine in. And because it's based on a van, there's a huge amount of headroom, seats for five people, and even room in the back to put two mountain bikes in upright. And again, Thanks to the van heritage with the seats folded down, there's 100 cubic feet of space here and a payload capacity of 600 kilograms. But the overall dimensions are very similar to a Super Mini. And it's cheap at just under 12,000 quid. Now, it's all very well starting off with a van as a base, but if it feels like a van to drive, then you're going to get fed up with it in a remarkably short time. So, have they made the Berlingo feel like anything more than a light commercial vehicle with some windows and some seats in the back? Initial impressions are very good. It's smooth, flexible and quiet. The 1.8 litre engine is specially tuned to deliver lots of low-down torque through the five-speed gearbox. It certainly doesn't feel like a van. Despite the indifferent road surfaces around the Cotswolds here, well, the ride comfort is surprisingly good. You seem to be sitting higher than you would in a, an average saloon car, and you get a tremendous view through these acres of glass. And despite the size of the sunroof, well, there's very little wind buffeting, even at speed. The road holding is safe and predictable, and the power steering very light. Certainly doesn't feel as though you're delivering the groceries. And it's no slouch. Citroen claim 0 to 60 in around 12 seconds and a maximum speed of 100 miles an hour. I should think the draft from the sunroof gets a bit more at that speed though. But in the Cotswold lanes on a summer's evening, it's an excellent form of transport. Simple, well laid out instruments, all the controls fall to hand and quite a sophisticated radio cassette. A surprising omission in view of all this huge glass area is no air conditioning and that could be a pain on a very hot day. But you've got this huge sunroof and if you want to wait they say there might be a more luxurious model later on next year with air conditioning in the spec. Everybody in the motor industry is looking for a particular niche for their product, and Citroen certainly found one with this car. After all, it's got all the joys of open-top motoring, the space of a big estate car, the practicality of a five-door hatchback, and the price of a Super Mini. You tell me what it is. <laughs>
This is a very important car for Hyundai. The coupe did very well for them establishing them in the mainstream market. This is going to have to do the same in the fleet in the executive sector. And in this, the V6 version, it's what, a penny under £19,000. And if you look around it, you have definitely got £19,000 worth of car here, no doubt about it. You've got power everything, air conditioning, power seat for the driver, £20,000 of the car. The problem is, if you take it right to the front of the car, it's got that Hyundai badge, and at the end of the day, half the time, how we define a car is more to do with how we define the mark of the manufacturer. It. This dome-shaped boot gives the car quite a stately look from the rear. The shape of these rear lights echoes those at the front as well. And that's, that's about it, really. There's, there's nothing else at the back that's... Well, yeah, there is. There's this. It's, um... I think they call it Americana, and it's a bit like what happens when the Japanese try and make Harley-Davidson's. Sort of... Hmm. I don't know, it... Maybe if it, I just... No, I don't know. Maybe it'll just come off all together and then I, I can leave it. <clears throat> well, there's nothing wrong with Americana. I just don't know if this is the right place for it. I don't know. I do not know. If you look around it, you've got £19,000 of the car, there's no doubt about that. The car grows on you from the point of view of looks. I actually think it's quite a handsome looking thing, apart from the back. At the end of the day, this is more of a marketing story than anything else. The case is, the car's fine, no problem. It's a pleasant drive, it's got a little kit on it, I'm sure it'll last and last. Hyundai's don't fall apart that way. The problem is, it is a Hyundai. It has that Hyundai badge on the front, and how will people take it? It is a marketing story at the end of the day, and uh, that is about us identifying who we can go, do a good job with, understanding um, what that's all about, and then going out and doing it. And so we've spent quite a bit of time getting ready for this launch. We've known about it for some time, and we've been preparing the ground, particularly to tackle the business user market. Um, so we're talking about companies traditionally have maybe sort of under 10 cars, rather than the big fleets where we think we can do a good job of work. So we've been paying the ground in terms of getting our dealers, identifying who their target customers are locally, getting them to understand um, the requirements of dealing with that marketplace, and getting our offer right. Uh, not just the car, but you know everything that goes around that. So for instance, we're offering uh, three years free servicing uh, to, to the business user community with, with this car. So yeah, a lot of, lot of time has gone uh, into the marketing planning. And finally, Ken, what about the back of it? Well. Maybe when I'm aiming a car at you. <laughs> there are three different versions, two different engines, both petrol, one a four cylinder, two litre. This is the V6, two and a half litre, a completely new engine, redesigned. Good news to anybody who's ever had anything to do with the previous V6 engine version. This one isn't quite as bad. You're still going to be looking realistically at below 20 miles of the gallon around town, but it is a V6. It is going to be a thirsty thing. Prices start from 13,999 for the entry level. That's with a two liter engine. Rising up to this, which is the top of the range, it costs 18,999 pounds. But the good news is there is 19,000 pounds worth of car here. There's an awful lot of equipment right the way through the range. All of them have ABS, they have a passenger and a driver's airbag, they have air conditioning as standard. There's an awful lot of equipment up to this level when you've got automatic air conditioning, cruise control, electric driver's seat, leather, everything you'd expect to find in a luxury car. And that is where there is maybe a bit of a problem sets in. At least that's the issue here. The car's fine, it drives well, looks well, you get used to it. But here it is, there's the issue. At the end of the day, however good the car is, it is a Hyundai. One thing it can't be accused of is being bland. It has a definite image. Whether or not you like it is a different thing entirely, but it has presence on the road. These flares over the wheels, front and rear, are a reference, I suppose, to the coupe that has done so much for Hyundai. It's really put them in the mainstream and is continuing to sell very well. They're hoping, obviously, this is going to do the same thing in a very different market. The coupe, 
young, trendy. This is more your executive. It's a company car. At least that's what Hyundai hope. The prices make sense. There's an awful lot of equipment. It makes sense as a package. Whether or not people will buy it, that remains to be seen. It is a Hyundai after all. And those looks, well, I like it. I do. Or do I? Hang on. The S-plate bun fight has died down and this year's registration change will be the last to happen yearly and a new system of letters and numbers has been proposed. It's the mass volume sellers who have found it difficult to cope. So we asked Ford Chairman and Managing Director Ian McAllister about how the change will affect his company. Probably about 550,000 cars registered in 22 days and the industry can no longer cope with the peak in demand. So the government has now agreed, firstly, to change the letter twice a year, in September and in March, and secondly, when the existing system runs out in 2000, to move to a new number plate system that will enable us to smooth out demand by chase changing four times a year, if that's what we have to do. The new system is going to have an alphanumeric combination at the front, an age identifier in the middle, like one, two, three, up to 99, and then an alphanumeric two-letter combination at the end. And the alphanumeric letter at the end will be a regional identifier that will tell uh, a witness to an accident, for example, which area of the country the car was first registered. All this sounds good news for the police and for volume manufacturers like Ford, but what's in it for us, the customers? The customers are going to benefit in a big way because, it, I mean, buying a new car is a very important experience. It's an expensive purchase. It's an important purchase. We want to make sure it's a memorable purchase for the customer. And we can only do that if we can pay time and give the customer attention. The August peak doesn't allow us to do that simply because the dealers can't handle that number of customers walking in within a very restricted time period and buying a car. So the dealers are glad that this year's big August rush will be their last. It's a logistical nightmare to have to deal with one month representing a quarter of the industry. And so in terms of having to produce the, uh, the vehicles well in advance, and in terms of moving those vehicles from the manufacturing plants through the intermediate, suppli intermediate supplier to the dealerships, that's not something we'd want, to, uh, we'd want to have to experience on a month-to-month -month basis. And I'm, we're delighted that the, the annual identifier is going away for that reason. And over and above that, it gives us the opportunity to produce vehicles closer to the time when, vehicle, when the vehicles are going to be actually bought by the customers. And over and above that, the dealers benefit because of the uh, less burdensome cash flow requirements uh, to do with all that stocking when uh, they have to stock for such a huge month. After the break, Rachel Ford asks for your help in nailing dodgy dealers and news of the Mercedes Maybach flagship. You know the old saying, all that glitters isn't necessarily gold? Well, the one product that applies to more than anything else is the car. Us, the drivers, we're being duped every year with resprays and things that look like gold but aren't underneath, they could be just scrap metal. One in six drivers has problems with their car, according to official figures, within six months of buying a new or second-hand car. I'm researching a documentary for ITV looking at car troubles, people who've had quite serious troubles either buying or selling or servicing. And believe me, there are plenty of people with problems. 
Now, not everyone would think that a Cortina is the coolest car in the world, but it's one man's pride and joy. Ken Banks has had a real problem. Hello, Ken. Hi. Right, what's Isn't happened? Uh, well, I put the car in for, um, to have a new roof on it. It's a soft top, convertible. Uh, and I was going away, away on a holiday a fortnight afterwards. This was in May last year. Uh, and I said to him, you know, just uh, don't hurry while you get the gear. And 14 months later, we still got it. 14 months in the garage? Yeah. What have you done? Well, I keep ringing him and he keeps on saying there's problems with materials and problems with wires, getting the roof up and down again. And then people have been off with broken legs and he's had insurance claims in. And he always, I normally ring on a Friday, then he's told me to ring on the Wednesday or he'll ring me. I think in the 14 months he's rung me about three times. And you wanted that convertible roof because for you it's a classic car, isn't it? And you wanted to use it throughout the summer. Because so there was only 100 convertible uh, Cortinas made, I believe. What are you going to do now? But I'm, I'm going to get some advice off the trading standards and see what uh, they say. Well, I'm afraid to go down and see the car because it's to see what state it's in after 12 months, well, 14 months. Well, good luck, Ken. I hope you get it sorted. Thanks very much. Ken's problem, particularly unusual, 14 months waiting for his car to get a new roof. Shouldn't laugh about it, but particularly unusual. If you have similar troubles, particularly uh, if you've had problems with servicing, if you think you've been sold a dud car, give us a call on the number that's below. One of the standard lines used by dealers is they all do that. That rattle that won't go away is often a characteristic of the car. The Office of Fair Trading have reported that the extent of the problem in the £17 billion motor trade is appalling and stated that used car salesmen were fragrantly trading on the ignorance of their customers. They've also said that up to 28,000 cars a year are written off after serious accidents, yet are patched up and put back on sale. If you have been sold what you think is a dud car or just a rusty pile of metal or you've had a particularly bad service that's cost you a lot of money, you can go to Trading Standards. They're at every local council. I've come to Trafford Trading Standards to speak to Joe Mann, who's their head. You're making a major purchase, one of the major purchases of your, your life next to your house probably. Don't rush into these things. It's very easy to be taken in by a, a nice looking motor that, that seems to be your dream car and that might not be there if you don't buy it that second, that's a recipe for disaster. The public really ought to take the time to shop around just as you would with any other major purchase. Look what you're going to buy, how you're going to finance it. Take someone with you who is qualified and skilled in examining a vehicle. It's too many people buy a nice looking vehicle that's superficially shiny, got the radio, the fluffy dice, everything's there and the underneath can be dropping out of it. So that's a, again, it, it's storing up problems for the future. In your long career within Trading Standards you must have seen some real scams. What, what sort of things have you seen? Well, all sorts. I mean, the public face a very risky business when they go buying a second hand car. It's often a case of the, the unscrupulous taking advantage of the uninformed. Most of us are not really technologically capable of telling what actually goes on under the bonnet. And um, so we see examples where major faults in engines have been disguised so that the vehicle will get about two or three miles down the road before it starts developing major engine or gearbox faults there is still the problem of misdescription of vehicles where the history is um, often a, a tissue of lies that the odometer, the myelometer may have been turned back by 30, 40,000 miles to give an impression that the vehicle has only travelled a low mileage and that can net up to 30 to 50 pound a th for every thousand miles for a dealer he turns a clock back. If people do have car troubles what are their rights? Can they get any sort of compensation? You, you obviously would first of all approach the trader to try and get these things put right, but many of them would say that as soon as a vehicle left their forecourt, they, their liability went with it. That's not true. But then consumers have got to start looking at contacting trading standards, consumer advice centres, to get information about what their rights are. If there are any misdescription elements, we would look into it but um, they may at the end of the day be faced with having to take an action in the county court against the trader. 
So some easy steps to avoid buying scrap metal when you think it looks like gold. If you've had or are having car troubles, I'd really like to hear from you for this documentary that we're making. Call 0640 625 101. We'd like to hear about the problems that you've been having. The Board of Management of Daimler-Benz have decided to go ahead with development of that huge Mercedes-Benz concept, the Maybach. The Daimler-Benz plant in Sindelfingen has been earmarked as the production location for this ultra-luxury machine. Jürgen Schremp, chairman of the Daimler-Benz AG board, told us by deciding in favour of building the Mercedes-Benz Maybach, we're once again underlying our claim of representing the absolute creme de la creme. The Maybach will be a masterwork of automotive technology, setting ultimate standards in luxury features and engineering. Well, the new model range is named after designer Wilhelm Maybach, who was born in 1846, a longtime companion of Gottlieb Daimler and one of Germany's most famous automobile designers, who was accepted into the Hall of Fame for his performance and achievements. Like the Maybach Zeppelin in the 1930s and the Mercedes-Benz 600 Pullman until 81, when its production ceased, the Mercedes-Benz Maybach, we're told, will be individually built for each customer in a very small and very exclusive series. Mercedes are insisting that the Maybach will have absolutely no effect on the top market position of the S-Class. The Mercedes-Benz Maybach will not be competing with our other model ranges, says Herr Schremp. It will complement our existing range adding a fascinating vehicle opening, an additional market segment, and appealing to a very special group of customers. And a very rich group as well.